the driving gloves were a combination of gearheads. John, the instigator. Derek, the conservative. Will, the builder. Sean, the racer. And maybe a guest. Invite you to listen while they sit down, have a drink, and discuss cars. Subscribe to the podcast No Driving Gloves. Time now. Well, it's no driving gloves, and for our poor Facebook viewers, we've been trying to do some and been experimenting with live streaming on normally Tuesday nights, but we jumped it to Wednesday tonight, and this is our first time debuting on face our Facebook channel live. Whoa, so give whoa, us some feedback. Whoa. Nobody told me it was on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, they... Maybe maybe I forgot to put it in the email. I can't remember. Oh, okay. Well, I love the advice that the the streaming service gives at the beginning before you even sign in. Good lighting will make you look amazing. Like, no, no. Have you have you seen us? Nothing will help make us look amazing. I was going to say, no, look at I'm me. Sorry. No. Yeah. My podcast yeah. T-shirt, my Hawaiian esque shirt yeah. here. I cheetah mean, print, Hawaiian, whatever that is. It's not cheetah print. Well, actually, maybe it is. <laughs> well, and we're we're not the fashion uh, guru or the fashion podcast, but yeah, that's why that, it's, that's know, why there, it's there no a, driving gloves. There is a very famous car collector. Um, what's his name that does the little horsey stuff? The little horsey stuff. Would you be speaking of Would you be speaking of Ralph Lauren's polo brand, sir? Yeah, that might be it. I thought that was a little um, working man, and they were going hammering spikes in down the railroad. Yes, yes, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. So, have you been up to anything interesting this week? Uh, up to anything or up to anything interesting? Two different questions. Uh, well, I had I, one question. Oh, okay. <sighs> no, no, I have not. Um, basically just working a lot. And uh, that's that's about it. Um, trying to play with cars every now and then. And yeah, that's, that's about where I am. Yeah, exciting. I'm typical me, podcasting. Anxiously awaiting a call from Hyundai or Ford about my new trucks. Uh, seeing how that goes. Um, Getting back into the mini truck scene. Yes. You bet. You bet. Unfortunately, to get the 4,000 pound towing capacity out of the Maverick, which I just hate, Will's going to have to make me a new tailgate or something for that. I've got to go four wheel drive. And I just hate the idea of lowering a four wheel drive pickup it should start too it just seems to make it so much more complicated but yeah four wheel drives are supposed to be lifted we've had this conversation many times well we're we're going to do it the um cyclone way even though that's a gmc product we'll maybe lower that maverick and see what we can do to maintain that four thousand pound towing capacity so any aftermarket companies out there that would like to take this venture on i've got a builder and i've got a <laughs> I hopefully will have a car loan, but so that's where, where I've been going with that. Did you happen to, so my, my question is, well, no, no, no. We got to go back to the mini truck thing. Cause I got to know if you're going to go full on like late eighties, early nineties, mini truck. I mean, you put in a sound system in it, some big, you know, big woofer, get some bass rolling. What are we, what are we looking at here? I don't know how far I would go. Uh, and actually, I was talking to somebody on one of the mini truck forums or Facebook pages, whatever they're called today, who wanted to build an authentic 80s mini truck. And it was so funny because these guys are saying, well, in the 80s, they were using air shocks. And in the 80s, they were doing this. And in the 80s, they were doing that. And I said, I got on there and said, oh, wait a second. That stuff was in the 90s. <laughs> you know, back in the 80s, we were still cutting coils on half the trucks and turning torsion bars and making our own flip kits and heating springs and you know the you know the big advent of kits and rolling out nationwide really didn't take place and to, uh, if you did had anything other than an S10 or a Ford Ranger and it, their drop I beams that wasn't available and it was just kind of funny to somebody trying to build this 80s mini truck and these guys that I don't know when they grew up 
<laughs> we're trying to say, well, this is what it was in the old days. No, you weren't even in the old days yet. And the 80s had it a lot easier than the 70s. So I just, just I, it's, I want to say it's fun to be old and watch these young guys try to do what we did back then. And they can't get that raw. And I don't know if I do a sound system anymore. It's kind you know, it's, it's weird. I mean, you can't enjoy it because I don't know. There, I think there's noise regulations and stuff, which I just heard today that speaking of noise regulations, did you see California? Uh, well, Porsche has elected not to sell the new GT3 Touring in California because it will exceed their noise limitations, which is something like maximum RPM and high gear, et cetera. And somehow they're right on the threshold. So they won't be selling the 2021 Porsche GT3 Touring in California. Now, whether that means you can register them there or not, I don't know, because I'm sure you can buy one in Vegas and drive it back to your house, but maybe you have to take it right. in Vegas too. But uh, first world problems for those guys in California, right? Well, that's... I. <clears throat> That's, <laughs> it, it's shocking. I'm sorry. It's, it's, but that's because that's probably a big market for them. I mean, that's where a good chunk of money is. And that's where a good chunk of you know, sports car enthusiasts and enthusiasts of those type of cars are out there. I mean, we saw it with the reveal of the, the C8 Corvette. They did it in California for a reason the market is right out there. So, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting and scary at the same time, because I mean, I guess we all have seen this in the automotive hobby for, for years or, or the automotive industry in general, but, you know, regulating the, the internal combustion engine and the, and the car world into something smaller and different. Uh, I hate to get down that road, but <laughs> Here we are, because you brought it up, John. Well, you know me. I'm good at bringing that stuff up. And it kind of goes, I, I, when I announced and did the post for the, the live stream, I put something up about California and already got into it with somebody on Facebook. That was me posting, and there's no driving gloves. That wasn't any of the other hosts. And, you know, it's this meme that's been going around for two or three days where, California basically told electric car owners that they can't charge their cars because of power sh shortages. What that, can somebody from California comment and you know, maybe tell us what's what's up with your state? Now you want me to buy an electric car and now you won't let me charge it. This just doesn't make sense. Uh, honest truth. They just don't want you charging it during peak usage out. Uh, to, you know, relieve the, the power grid and, you know, all that other stuff. But isn't that been the concern with electric cars for a while now is that the power grid can't keep up with it. And we've only got what, two, 3% of the cars at best in California that are electric. And we're already saying, sl sl slow down your charging. Well, that's, I mean, that is, we've talked about it on the show and, and everybody talks about it. That's one of the, one of the situations that has to come up is the infrastructure in, in America. I was just having a conversation with a friend the uh, Monday this week, and we got on to the topic of internal combustion, electric, all that. And it, it comes down, it, it comes down to a number of things. Don't, don't get me wrong. And this was a, a someone who has worked in the automotive industry at a fairly high level and knows the inner workings of the industry better than those of us who are not deeply ingrained in it. And yeah, we, we were talking, have a great conversation about it. And you know, brought up, started to discuss the, you know, move from the horse and buggy and horse and carriage and horses to the early internal combustion engine, steam power, and electric in the late 1800s. And the struggle there, just as it is today with electric cars, was infrastructure. None of those 
options had an infrastructure horse and carriage uh, your your horse you had to feed it and water it and and keep it alive and make sure it had energy to go that was pretty well understood from hundreds of years of agriculture moving into the internal combustion engine now you know internal combustion steam electric at the time we have to remember that really in the major cities in the u.s that was green technology because horses were leaving behind their manure that was not being cleaned up effectively when horses would die in the street they oftentimes would not get moved in the big cities for days and that bred a lot of disease in the cities so actually an internal combustion engine that uh, you know put out some emissions <clears throat> that may have smelled bad at the time you know, it wasn't making anybody die at the time like the manure and the the dead horse carcasses uh you know steam same thing you, you know it was much cleaner and electric of course at the time was very clean but also electric not many people had power outside of the major cities at the time so it really was a city car that mostly women drove there were men that drove them but they became popular with women and until the infrastructure became better for one of those options at the time internal combustion because you were able to get fuel at hardware stores blah 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 and of course the electric self-starter came about which made it much easier to start uh, a internal combustion engine that's what allowed the internal combustion automobile to really take hold in america and move forward I guess it's where we, we are right now well, it's where we are right now with the move to electric. There has to be some major steps made along the way to get us into that next evolution of transportation. Well, it's – and you, you go way back to the beginning of the petrol-powered automobile and how it became – you know, slowly became accepted because – we didn't have the range and the durability and electricity wasn't everywhere in, you know, 1900, 1910, 1920. I am a little bit better in 1920. But I think that's a little bit where we are with electricity or the electric cars right now is in the early days of the gas automobile, there weren't filling stations everywhere. You would, like you said, buy your gas in bottles at the hardware store. And take it with you and fill, you know, it's just like going in and buying a, you know, Mountain Dew like I have here all the time. Just going and picking up your gasoline and then pouring it into your car. And the infrastructure wasn't even built for the gas powered automobiles, but that's what was accepted. And there, you know, there was some range. And these people that went on these cross country journeys in what, 1905, 1907, they Huh? First tra so, transcontinental trips were in 1903. But you're saying first. I'm just saying people yeah. that did it, you know, that, um, you didn't necessarily, you didn't have your GPS to tell you how far the next gas station was and what the gas cost. You just went and hoped you got to the next place that you could buy fuel. So it's a change. And, you know, I've always made it clear that I'm a supporter of electric cars and the technology behind them. And I'm even defend, defend Lotus move to electric cars because this next vehicle that they release uh, for the everyday man, not the 2000 power horsepower Ajiva or whatever it's called. Um, they've announced this is the last gasoline powered car out of Lotus. And all you get is, Oh no manual transmissions. It better, you know, better be rear, you know, rear wheel drive, all this stuff. I think Chapman would have supported it. They're fast. Batteries are becoming lighter. I think he would have been all about a move to electric and figuring out how to extract the most performance out of it. So that's just where I sit on it. But, well, and you know, I got, I got kind of off on one tangent of the conversation I had the other day. The other tangent of that or the other path we have to look at is green technology and what that is and electric vehicles are not putting out the tailpipe emissions that we are used to with internal combustion 
but the conversation has to be had about how the batteries are, are made, you know, the environmental impact of mining the materials that need to be used to create the batteries for this, as well as the, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm stumbling over words here for some reason, but the, once those batteries are no longer, you know, valuable to the vehicle and can't be recharged, can't be reused, how are they disposed of? What is the environmental impact? All of that has to be part of the conversation. I'm not, no, I'm not saying one thing or the other, cause it's, it gets into a lot of political discussion, which we don't need, but all sides of the coin have to be discussed, looked at and thought about because you also have to generate the electricity that's going to charge the batteries. And how is that going to be done? Well, it's, it's, it's a very wide open topic. There's two, two arguments I'm going to put up against you is that, there is new battery technology. It seems to be being developed that does not necessarily involve some of the hazardous materials and the mining and stuff. I don't understand how they're doing it. Um, we're eliminating the mine it somewhere, ship it somewhere, ship it back to where we mined it, ship it somewhere. And then all oh, we can finally put it in the car. Uh, the new, uh, I know the lightning for sure. And I would assume the Mach-E falls in. Ford's building those and assembling those batteries in the United States, which, yeah, the, they're still harvesting and mining materials and shipping it here. But at least not they're not harvesting the materials, shipping it somewhere, then having the batteries built, and then they've got to be shipped again or something. At least they're starting here in the country. There are experiments and there are some recyclable batteries now coming to market. You know, you might not be getting the massive range out of them, but that technology, I think, you know, technology has got to catch up a little bit there. But going back and what I'm going to say exactly what you said about the power, it's kind of interesting if you listen to the advertising on some of, you know, the electric cars or even some of these ultra low emission vehicles and that. And it's, they've went from, you know, zero emissions or whatever to a line that is zero tailpipe emissions, which I just find interesting. It's a little subtlety thing. I'm sure it's because somebody somewhere brought a lawsuit up that said, hey, wait a second, my electricity going in my car, or my hydrogen going into my car or even the, you know, gasoline or whatever, it's producing emissions somewhere. So now we're selling these cars. A Tesla is a zero tailpipe emissions car. It doesn't have a tailpipe, but never mind that. I just find it interesting that somehow legal has gotten involved and one little word was added that I think makes it a lot more acceptable to, or they think makes it more acceptable. But, the one thing, I guess, and to kind of transition into a topic is at least we'll always have car shows and the freedom of car shows to see this history that we're talking about, right? No. <laughs> anybody Why do you got to bring it up, John? Why do you got to bring it up? I <laughs> say, anybody who's seen the article that, no, Eric sent me. Uh, might know what the I'm article, talking about. The article that launched me into a ty tyrant, tirade, Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, monster this evening, right before the show, because I got so that, that's why we were so late irritated. Because I had to calm the Derek down. The Derek Rex, his little <laughs> arms. <laughs> I know, right? His uh, yeah. So what John is referring to is if anyone saw it, I don't remember where it was posted. I caught it via a Facebook post, but Haggerty has announced that they have purchased the Amelia Island Concour. And I guess what kind of launched me into my, uh, my texting fit and my, uh, fit with John in the pre-show is that, 
over the last, I, I don't know how long it's been, about a year maybe or so, Haggerty keeps announcing that they're buying this or buying that. And we've seen the Greenwich Concours be purchased by Haggerty. Haggerty has acquired the Concours of America at St. John, the former Meadowbrook Concours. Uh, they, I'm trying to remember everything, John. I was trying to pull up their website to kind of see if they had a list of everything they do, and I couldn't quite find it. I'm not sure if you did or not. Well, I, I got the Haggerty but, website in front of me, and I went to their, I think it's under experiences now as the header tag, but it's actually, they call it lifestyle. And this isn't a complete list, but they do garage and socials they now own motor motorsport reg uh i can't remember that's dot com or dot org but i know for the last decade 15 years that's where you go to register to do track days and everything so they're controlling that which i'm sure they're you know pushing product with they run the or own the california melee i believe the greenwich concours like you said um, they sponsor all kinds of car car club events and things. Um, they have a chowder society. You mentioned that now that, you know, the Concours of America, the um, Amelia Island Concours that Hagerty now has purchased controlling a stake into. They have their driving opportunities where they now have a, they manage drive share, which is a classic car rental company, kind of like the, um, Turo, I guess, of classic cars. If you've got a classic and you want, would allow somebody else to drive it, you can join the drive share and rent out your 67 Camaro, saying that because that's what's it kind of in the picture here. Um, or you can rent out your, you know, whatever it is, your Ferrari or whatever through Hagerty. Or if you wanted to drive one of these things, you can rent it through, I'm going to say Hagerty, but it's drive share. Uh, they do driving experiences where they set it up so that you can experience some cars that maybe you would never see. I hate to put it into this kind of complaining, but they also have the Drivers Academy, which helps educate teen drivers, which I think anybody who knows our show knows we support teen drivers and any education, and I think that's great. But they also, I believe, have reacquired the HVA. Uh, you know, Historic Vehicle Association. It's something they started as a collector's foundation, and then it became some uh, Historical Vehicle Association or something spun off, and now it's back under their umbrella. And it's just getting to be, and that's just under one tab of their website. I don't know what happens if, you know, yeah. with entertainment, they've got all, all and, of their stuff. And Yeah, and that's, like you said, with the driving education portion, I can't remember the name of it right now, not everything Haggerty does is I, I'm not trying to knock what Haggerty does. You, they do good things. They, you know, driver's education, very important. As John said, we are big supporters of that and talk about it on the show occasionally. The, the drive share, the rental renting classic cars. That's kind of cool. Cause you're right. You're going to get a chance to drive cars that you're not going to get to drive somewhere else. But I guess the, the unique thing about the car show world, the, the concours, and I mean, even, and again, not knocking Haggerty, not knocking the Henry Ford, not knocking any other institution that does anything like this, but Haggerty is also the main sponsor of both Motor Muster and Old Car Festival at, at the Henry Ford now. And my question just becomes, and it's, it's more of a question. The, the interesting thing, and, and I think the unique unique and fun thing about the concours and these shows is that they all have their own feel and their own vibe. And Bill Warner down at Amelia worked very hard to create a certain feel to the Amelia Island concours versus what Pebble Beach is versus what the Concours of America is versus whatever other concours is out there, keels and wheels, all of those. When you get a company to come in and, and buy the concours up, basically buy this up as a, a business or as a, a venture, 
you're going to get the brand marketing. You're going to get the Haggerty brand infused. No matter how much you say, we're going to keep the unique feel, we're going to keep this, you're going to go to the Amelia Island Concour and you're going to see Haggerty branding everywhere. It might still be different cars, but you're going to go to the Concour of America later in the year and you're going to get bombarded with the Haggerty brand. You're going to the same show with different cars now, just in different places around the world. In my, That's my take on it. And it worries me for the future of these shows because how many of them are going to survive all branded under the Haggerty umbrella? Is that really going to be feasible to have this many concours all falling under the brand of Haggerty and it's either it's experience uh, branch or it's entertainment branch of the company. It just, it, it, it worries me and it, it's, it's, I hope it doesn't turn out disappointing. That's, that's where I am on it. I don't see it necessarily eliminating these events and that, but what made these events nice and interesting is the uniqueness of every one of them. And you talk about branding and I, you know, honestly, I don't care if Coker tire comes in and sponsors the whole thing. I don't care if Hagerty comes in and sponsors the whole thing. I don't care if Barrett Jackson comes in and sponsors the whole thing. But the problem is since they own a controlling interest or they own an interest in these places and these events, I very much see a team being created, a corporate team that develops each of these shows. And yeah, <clears throat> it might really help say keep unique cars and you won't go to this, the same, you know, three events in the year and see the same, what, whatever you might call it, you know, I'm not even going to use a car name, but you know, the thingamajigger by so-and-so that's a 1932 that's 48 feet long or whatever, you know, Cruel DeVille's car, Cruella DeVille's car. That you know, it, they might be able to keep it. Oh, that's at Pebble this year, and we're not going to allow it to be showed at any of our or shown at any of our other shows. But you're going to get the same feel, and you're going to have the same. I want to say the same same ticketing experience, the same entertainment. This you know, the speakers and the format, and that's what I enjoy about Concours, and I always you know, kind of enjoyed about Amelia. I haven't went in years because it started to become and feel more like Pebble Beach and not the thing that Bill Warner originally created 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And I mean, that's inevitable. It's these things are going to grow and that's going to happen. I just fear the, the, the corporate stamp and chain, you know, keeping everything under the same brand and being, the while the the puzzle when assembled might look different it's kind of like all the pieces are cut exactly the same and it's just that overall picture that looks a little bit different but when all the pieces are the same where's the fun where's the adventure um where's you know where's the excitement so you know amelia island i can get there in seven hours so why would i want to go to greenwich or why would i want to go to you know michigan to a concord when it's the same branding. And I said a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, I just casually heard on another podcast and another car insurance company. And part of their tagline is, I mean, I'm going here tonight, you know, going up against Hagerty and saying things like this against Hagerty, you got a question, but there's already an insurance company doing it because their ad is, we focus on insuring your car, not everything else. And I worked with Hagerty years ago and worked with him at many events. And they always have this idea that if you notice it's Hagerty now, it's not Hagerty insurance. They want to sell you an experience. And this is something they've been building for over a decade. And at some point you got to just kind of go, Hey, let's stop and, are you an insurance company? Are you an event company? Are you a rental car company? Are you a racing company? Are you an education company? It's good to be diverse, but it's like um, 
it's like the Swiss army knife of, com you know, automotive companies. You can't do it all and do it all well. And I'm not, you know, I've always insured my collector cars when I've had them with Hagerty. I've always enjoyed their services and their rates and had really good experiences with them. I knew McKeel through um, who owns Hagerty and kind of, I think he founded it. If not, he really developed it to what it is today. Knew him through McPherson College and such. But it, they never would give me a job. So I don't mind, you know, eh, kind of antagonizing them. But it's, I'm with Derek. We've got to, they've got to look at it and maybe go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Or there's nobody else to, who do you go to? Um, every, you know, everybody wanted to knock on the door of Hagerty and, well, Hagerty sponsor it. Well, Hagerty sponsor it. And guess what? They sponsor everything now. And it's, I'm trying to think of, uh, well, I'll, I, I'll jump in and kudos to, to McKeel for having a successful company. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's America, right? But yes. I guess what also, yeah, what also kind of, uh, I, I hate to say, you know, like rubs you the wrong way or, or anything like, but it's just. To me, there's a feel from Haggerty with some of these moves that they're trying to control and tell you what the collector car lifestyle or the collector car hobby should be. You know, they're trying to create the collector car experience and the collector car. And I guess to me, that's the unique thing about the collector car world is everybody's in it for a different reason. Everybody's in it to have their own experience and their own uh, version of, of fun with their collector car. And I feel like what Haggerty is, is doing with these moves is trying to, basically create a, as I said, kind of a, you know, this is, this is, if you own a collector car or classic car, this is the type of world you should, should revolve in. And, and these are the things that the collector car community do. And I just, there's just something that, that just doesn't feel right. And I don't know what that is yet, but I'm it's looking just, at it. It's go ahead. I'm looking at it, and I guess I'm looking at it from auction company standpoint. You know, everybody thinks every auction's Barrett Jackson, and it has a huge impact. And they were just the first people to televise their auction, and so that's what people expected out of an automobile auction, and. Fortunately, you know, Barrett Jackson, you know, has a half dozen events now a year, but they're not an RM Sotheby's. Uh, um, they're not a Meekum. Every, every auction's a little bit different. But say Barrett Jackson decided to go on a, a buying spree. I mean, Craig Jackson's got the money to do it and the power to do it and the sell through rate that it wouldn't be that inconceivable of him going and buying up a lot of the smaller auction companies or merging, say with a Meekum. And then all of a sudden the uniqueness of the Meekum auction goes away or Russo steel with uh, drew Alcazar. I mean, he gets down there and right in the thick of things and he he's in the ring with the bidders and he likes that kind of a circus thing, which 20 years ago, Barrett Jackson was kind of that, but they had to, I think as our guest said a couple of weeks ago, they had to learn how to time cars going through and working with TV schedules and advertiser schedules. And it's become a Hollywood production. And, you know, Meekum, I mean, Dana Meekum's down there in the thick of things with the bidders, but Craig's out in the crowd talking to the bidders and it's a different you know, just everything's a little bit different about each one of these auctions. And if somebody started coming in and buying them up, and I mean, we used to have Sotheby's and we used to have RM as separate companies and they've merged and 
they had very similar auction platforms. But I think RM was a little bit, to me, it was always a little bit edgier than Sotheby's. And, you know, Bottoms could easily merge into that group. And you wouldn't notice a huge change. But all of a sudden, if they brought in, you know, a Russo Steel, or they brought in a Meekum, or they brought in a Barrett Jackson, or a leaky auction, it it would change whatever they brought in. And there's no doubt that, you know, Hagerty's going to come in and do this. And, you know, Hagerty's a huge sponsor. It really amazes me. Hagerty really doesn't have a podcast. That's about the only medium they're not in. And I've actually tried to talk to him about it a few times. But, you know, it's a space they're not in, but it's, I don't know. It's just, they're everywhere. And, you know, I've thought, uh, you know, I've thought of a couple production ideas and that, and I'd love a sponsor. Who do you go to? First company that pops into your head is Hagerty. And it used to be maybe year one, or it used to be Coker Tire, or, but Hagerty is just, that's the go-to name. And, no, no offense or no insult to McKeel. That's the go-to name. And that's, I think, what the o- overall thing is, is when it comes to thinking, you know, collector car insurance, Hagerty's on the front because they are everywhere. Um, you know, and I've got, like I said, I know I've met McKeel and I, he, he's, I, I've bumped into him and he's kind of remembered me. Uh, but I also know a lot of other people that work at Hagerty um, on all kinds of levels. And I know some people that have worked at Hagerty and have left and moved on. And it's always a great company to work for. Uh, I mean, they've got excellent benefits, excellent pay. I think it's hellacious travel if you're in one of their field teams. But um, I'm with, you know, I'm kind of with Derek is that, let's hold our ho- horses a little, or maybe somebody needs to step up and start buying into some of these concours, but who, who is there? That's, there's a question for you, Derek. Put Hagerty out. Who's next in line that could do something like this? Is there even a single entity out there that you think has their act together enough to even try to launch an offensive against Hagerty? That's a great question, John. <laughs> and that was a stall tactic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's like I said, you used to think, you know, Corky Coker used to do a lot. And, you know, now Corky's kind of retired from the business and moved on. I mean, they still have an event in Chattanooga and things, and he's mm-hmm. still in touch. But, you know... I remember Coker stuff and you know, there's, if you're in British, there was always, you could go to Victoria British or you could go to Moss Motors and they would help sponsor British stuff and, you know, send you stuff for your car shows and that. And year one would do it for your Chrysler stuff. And it's, but I don't think any of those could launch the kind of offensive because Hagerty isn't British cars. They, they aren't muscle cars. They aren't brass era cars. They aren't, aren't sports cars they aren't japanese cars they're everything and you know it's i don't know who anybody who is is encompassing on this planet as as they are and it says a lot to their brand and what they yeah they've done true and i would agree with that i think anybody else out there is a what i would call a niche market company like you say, you know, there's the British car companies, there's the muscle car groups, there's all the different, uh, let's take in the, in the VW and uh, oddly in the VW and Corvette world, Mid-America, Mid-America Motorsports, pretty big company, but they're not going to go up against Haggerty. They're they're They have two niche markets and that's what they do. I'm trying to think of some of the other groups that are out there, you know, restoration well, I, supply company out in California. They're strictly early car stuff, brass era, uh, horseless carriage and, and really pre pre world war two, mostly let's call it. The, there's, the there's all group, these. 
say, I'm only coming up with one other group that kind of has their hand in all the pots, in the Corvette pot, in the GM pot, in the Ford pot, in the Mopar pot, in the import pot, used to be the kit car pot. And that's Carlisle. They even, you know, they're in the antique mm. car stuff. Carlisle, but they're Pennsylvania and they're their little section of Pennsylvania, you know, Carlisle and Hershey's just down the road. And Carlisle is expanded. They still do a couple of, they've got a couple of events they handle in Florida. And I actually talked, I've talked to Carlisle a couple of times about a couple of different things, a couple of things when I was with Barber's and a couple of things independent. And if, I guess I might say they're the only company I know of that has their hand in every other pot. Well, you know who has their hand in every pot? No doubt about it. Is eBay Motors. No, oh, well, yeah. There you go. <laughs> but eBay's kind of a bad word in a lot of circles. Of course, I think Hagerty's kind of a bad word in a lot of circles too. Um, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to feel the ring for that. The the Pebble Beach Concord Elegance powered by eBay. Hmm. Doesn't have the same ring. Mm-hmm. Uh, eBay Motorsports Park. Oh, there we go. <laughs> and a little play on that. Yeah. But yeah, there aren't like you say, there there's not there are what I would call sponsor level industries out there and that's your coker tire your and really coker coker has their hand in all of those different markets because everybody needs tires and they make tires for pretty much every car all the way back to brass era horseless carriage and up and so they do but they're they're niche in the fact that they are just strictly pretty much tires or wheels they do wheels basically they're the wheel and tire guys, and that's about it. So you're not going to get a major, major purchase out of that company of a Concours or something like that. You're going to get some big sponsorships for sure to get their name out there and get their tires sold. But yeah, it is. Uh, Haggerty has has a business plan, obviously. They have a probably a strong strategic plan of what they're doing over the next five to ten years. And like I said, kudos to McKeel and his team for having such a successful company. But what I hope it doesn't do is I I don't want to use this, a strong word like ruin or anything like that, but I hope it doesn't change the face of the collector car world and the hobby that is built around it and and what all of the varying people that are in this hobby are in it for that's my only fear because when you have that one big dog that is trying to do all of this sometimes it backfires and it, it 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 isn't always for the better in every aspect it's the um what we're afraid of, and I think I'm going to coin a new ter- term here, the cookie cutter, I can't say it, uh, so we'll just say it's the cookie cutter ca- uh, fornication of the industry. Is they, I, That's what I'm terrified of, and that's what I alluded to earlier, is every concourse is going to be a cookie cutter of the other one. He, uh, the players may stay, change, but it's going to be the same same show it's i mean jimmy fallon every night is the same show with different players and i mean the whole late night gambit is the same show you know ever since was it steve allen created kind of the talk the late night talk show format and johnny carson tweaked it a little bit and leno tweaked it a little bit and letterman in 83 84 really tried to tweak it but by the end he was playing the same game. And that's, I guess you could look at, I guess, Haggerty late night TV. It's the same format, just the players change. The guy at the front door, Leno, Letterman, Fallon, um, Carson, 
I can't think uh, Arsenio Hall. I guess Arsenio really tried to change it up a little bit, but and I don't watch I don't watch a lot of late night TV. Is all even John Stewart? It it um it's all the same. Like I said, the the guy at the door, which would be your you know formerly head of the uh, Amelia Island, head of the Greenwich, head of you know is cha- is, is there. There's a figurehead, and then the guests are the cars. You know, you get Drew Barrymore, and you get whatever, Madonna, and you get, you know, I can't think of, I'm not good with celebrities. But you get the celebrities that pop on there, and it's, but is it not the same show every night? It's a monologue. It's a skit. It's three guests, and we're done. And is that what concours are going to be? Oh, yay, we get the parade of cars in. We see the cars. We have the judging. We have the guest speakers. We have the awards ceremony. And there's nothing to... Differentiate you know. Concord yeah. to Concord. Yeah. And yeah. what I would say is, you know, if, if you're a traveler, if you're someone who travels a lot, if you're like me, when I'm in a new town, a new city, new somewhere specifically for a concours let's tie it into that because hey why not i don't go when i go out to dinner when i'm when i'm there if i'm not going to one of the dinners for the event i don't go to outback steakhouse or uh, i'm trying to think of some chain restaurant names here and i'm blanking but i don't go down to outback or uh, oh charlie's or something like that i look for the local restaurant that you don't go to mcdonald's people, you look for the the local i was gonna do joint. the mcdonald's thing yeah. but i decided not yeah. to but yeah you, well, you, you don't, don't do that. when you, you're traveling you, you, some people do go to mcdonald's because it's comfortable and it's easy i don't i go to a restaurant i've never heard of that's a mom and pop owned restaurant or something like that and try their food because yeah. it's going to be something a little different you know, and unique and it's going to have a different flavor and that's that's the thing about concours. Each one has their own flavor. And is Haggerty going to come in and distill that down to a McDonald's style dinner? That's another good example of explaining what we're fearful of. But I think the audience probably is gathering where we're not big I think fans we're, of this. I think we're beating the dead horse that's in the yeah. road in the city yeah. <laughs> in the mid 1800s. I, I will disease. say <laughs> I could easily be, be persuaded to maybe see Hagerty's point of view if they'd like to sponsor the show. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. Or <laughs> no, at least one that, of that's... one of the people we know from Haggerty could come on and talk to us. And you all know who you are. <laughs> Be a, actually a long list, but and I know some of them do listen to the show. Exactly. Uh, I have so, a feeling we're all going to get phone calls. <laughs> but yeah, let's uh, we'll we'll quit picking on Haggerty. Maybe we should go ahead and talk about Zambonis for a change, but we haven't done that in forever. That's over. Is, That's done. Don't we've beat the beat Zamboni horse. horse. I I just want to keep beating dead horses. So. <laughs> The I don't beating live horses is evil. Beating dead horses mm, is yes. Uh, yes probably yes, shouldn't yes. say that since we're live. We're an animal <laughs> <laughs> animal friendly show. Please, no animals are ever harmed in the making of no driving gloves. That's another well, reason we we don't wear driving gloves because they're typically yeah. leather and that's not right. Yeah. Well, I mean we're big fans of horses. Look at Will. He puts four, five, six, seven, eight hundred horses under the hood of every car he builds. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We love horses, horses, horsepower, all of it. Well, so what we, else is going on in the car world other than Haggerty? Oh, um, and electric I did, cars. did have something hit my email today. Can I call this up quickly? I it was something so. I said, yeah, maybe I could. What was this thing on here? That's a guest that wants to talk to us. That's. Yeah, and while John's doing that, if you if you if you're 
listening to us for the first time and watching us for the first time and our first time listener, go back and listen to some of the other shows because, well, we've talked about a lot on the uh, now we're on our four year anniversary somewhere around there. And we've been doing this a while. So a lot of well, good topics. Today, the, tw- the 23rd? 623. The first episode released 624, 2017. And so, neither of us have a drink tonight to celebrate four year anniversary. Well, now that we're doing this live stuff, I don't think drinking is appropriate. So I've made it a dry show again. Maybe we'll change it back. I mean, fair I'm glad I knew, of, know that because you know, I almost had a glass of wine tonight. So, you know, Matt Farah kind of joked with us last year when we had him on and we told him, I think it was in the pre show, we said to him, Now we don't cuss on this show. And he goes, How's that working out for you? <laughs> he had kind of a really good point there. But I just like to kind of keep it a little bit nicer. Um, we do try you know, to be family friendly. But because that's what off. that's what the car hobby is, though. It's family friendly and it's getting the next generation into the car hobby. And you're not going to do that by sitting here and cussing each other out. And it, t- well, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, that's not the way we're going to get the next generation involved. It's not the way we're going to get families involved is to sit here and cuss and uh cut down things and, and yell at each other and, and do all that kind of stuff. So, well, I put up the website there on the screen. You can go there and catch all of our back episodes. I can't remember. This is going to be episode 176, 177. We're back on track with doing the weekly thing. This live streaming really helps. Give us some feedback on the live stream. It's also affected the, audio release because I don't edit nearly as hard as I used to because you can hear us stutter and double talk and put our foot in our mouth live. Um, You can also go to nodrivinggloves.com Facebook and follow us on Facebook and catch the the show live. I haven't created the YouTube link, but within an hour, you could go to nodrivinggloves.com YouTube and subscribe to the channel there. And look at that. I've even got one to go buy us a coffee. If you really like what you're hearing, uh, you know, Jason Hill last week, you know, was a guest. He's bought us a lot of coffee. Um, and uh, that's not why he was on the show. He honestly won the contest. But, he, you know, I heard somebody, well, I was ta- listening to an interview with Adam Curry. And D- VJ on MTV is probably where he's best known from the mid 90s. He's also the quote, one of the two inventors of podcasting as we know it. And think of what, you know, you go to see a movie, and it's going to cost you 15, 20 bucks by the time you even buy a candy bar. And hopefully we entertained you for an hour. So what's $3 to us, you know? This, yeah, but John, you know, did we, did people, we give you three dollars of value get, tonight? <laughs> you get you get public TV for free. That's the problem. Well, we got to pay there's, for this. There's a lot money. better you stuff. If, if, there's if, a lot better if, stuff if you, out there on public TV. If you want to keep the uh, Hagerty ads out of here, <laughs> uh, no. But if if you do like what you hear, I mean, send us a compliment. Leave us leave us some feedback. It really doesn't matter to our search engines, but it might matter to the next guy who wants to listen to us. If you, Hopefully it's positive feedback. But I think I'm going to wrap it up for the evening, Derek. And uh, and next week we'll be doing our NPR-style membership drive for an entire week. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'm going to hit this closing. I don't have a cool video clip, I think, to carry us all the way through it, but I'm going to hit it and uh, we'll talk to everybody next week. We'll be live streaming probably on Tuesday night again. Later. All right. Thank you for listening. And remember to look us up at nodrivinggloves.com. There you can find back episodes, links to products we recommend and links.